Shakespeare, Jane Austen, Virginia Woolf and James Joyce all try to find new words, phrases and ever more complex ways of describing the reality in which we live and the consciousness with which we make sense of it. Samuel Beckett, born in Dublin, Ireland, went the other way. He reduced language, stripping it of its essentials and turning it into something bare that gets to the base essence of our existence. He wrote everything, his plays, his novels and his prose in French and translated it then back into the English he'd grown up speaking in Dublin, Ireland. I spoke with Beckett expert, scholar and theatre director Nick Johnson at the Samuel Beckett Theatre at University College in Dublin, where Beckett had taught for a very short time in the 1920s before turning away from academia and disillusionment. I talked about how Beckett searches for life's meaning without giving us the promise that there's meaning located outside of our own capacity to move in the world as bodies and to speak about it. You have to pay attention and be as informed as possible. You have to try to understand things and you have to speak out. This is Nick's summary of what Beckett's work can teach us today. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. So I'm really happy to be sitting here at Trinity College in Dublin with Nick Johnson. Thank you, first of all, Nick, for being on the show today. You're so welcome. Thank you for inviting me, Uli. Yeah, it's quite exciting to be sitting here at Trinity College in Dublin and to talk about Samuel Beckett. Yes, in the Samuel uh, Beckett Center, no less. That's yeah. right. On another heavenly day. And exactly. It's the beginning of happy days, <laughs> right? Another heavenly day. <laughs> yes, it's unusually bright and sunny and gorgeous in Dublin today. So that's... I was going to ask you something about that line. It's the beginning of happy days, mm -hmm. which I think is my favorite Beckett play, maybe just because I saw it when I was very young. Yeah. The most the image of the woman buried in the mound of sand mm. talking to Willie stuck with me. You've been writing about Beckett, studying Beckett, staging Beckett, directing people, right? Mm -hmm. And you direct the study center here. Another heavenly day. I could also say another heavenly day. Mm -hmm. So when you take a small sentence like that, mm -hmm. what do you give the actors to start with? Because Beckett is such a text-based playwright because there isn't that much happening in terms of plot. Mm. Well, in performance as a starting point, I think you could start with text. There's a strong tradition of that, of reading the lines very deeply, looking for meaning, finding interpretation. I think in the case of Winnie and Happy Days, a huge amount of information comes to you from her physical position, from the fact that she is up to her waist and then later up to her neck. Right. And the conditions of saying that line in those physical states are very different conditions than saying another heavenly day if you're out strolling in the park and right. it's a beautiful day or you're up in the mountains and it's pouring rain. These are all the given circumstances of a naturalistic performance that that line might behave very differently. But when you have the curtains open and you see a body that is held up to their waist and that's the line that I hear, then I'm already being given a lot of tension right. for the actor, for the scenography, for the director, for the audience. We're already seeing a contrast between the physical disposition of the body right. and the information that comes from the environment and the language that Beckett has given us. So I would resist myself seeing the language in isolation right. in Beckett's plays from the situation. Right. I think the situation of the actors is extremely important because rather than the actor going on a journey to try and discover what did Beckett mean by this line, yeah. the actor is free to discover how do they find the inner resources to speak these words under these conditions. So what would that sound like, do you think? If you were to start, <laughs> uh, you would put Happy Days on stage. Mm -hmm. And so Winnie is, as you said, buried to her waist in sand. She has yes. a bag next to her, rummaging through all of her worldly possessions, we think. And mm -hmm. then at some point, we'll discover there's Willie a bit off, just yeah. his head or covered by a hat, maybe. So what would you say to the actress who's doing this? Well, a actor needs to really see the structure of the whole piece. 
And in order to have somewhere to go by the end, when it comes up to your neck, I think you have to start with genuine investment and belief in the hope that Winnie has at the beginning of the play. Beckett understood structure extremely well. One of the things he lectured in when he was here was Racine, and he saw Racine's plays as very mathematical, right. always building up to a central line, a central change, a central shift. And I think his plays have a beautiful shape to them. And so I think it would be a mistake if you mine for the negativity or the darkness of her situation yeah. very early on at the beginning, because that gives you no structure, it gives you nowhere else to go. So to me, the beauty of Beckett is often found in the contrast between the difficulty or the restraint or the restriction on the body together with this irrepressible life and vivaciousness that the actor really believes that today will be this. So I would encourage proper investment, I suppose, in the possibility that she has hope, that she begins with maximal hope, and that that hope is almost unkillable throughout the entire play. And we get closer and closer to the nadir of hope, but we never fully extinguish it. And that shape is in all of the great Beckett plays. We see that shape again in Endgame. We see it in Gatto, this structural striving, hopefulness, energy, going on speaking, going on talking, going on with something, whatever that task is, not being willing to be held by the actual circumstances of their constraint. Right. I think there's a very deep idea there, but there's also a fun idea for actors to play with, to say, how do I find the resources to keep smiling right. in this role? And he was looking at, I think, a lot of models in his life, biographically as well, of these type of Dublin Protestant women, people who might have been very trapped in their life mm -hmm. in Fox Rock or in the particular milieu in which he was speaking about, mm -hmm. who nonetheless made themselves up each day, combed their hair each day, got ready each day. Mm -hmm. And even if they were sort of being sucked under by the culture at a certain time, mm -hmm. they were nonetheless providing this surface of that joy. And it isn't a bitterness that he's bringing right. to that. I think it's a fascination with the process of human hope. What you just said, that there's this hope that won't be extinguished. He starts us out in a condition or a situation that's really shocking or startling yes. for the audience and for the actors that are trapped in these situations, yes. as if something else had already happened, Correct. and now that's where they are. Yeah. You're also saying at the same time, they're kind of waking up or coming to life at this moment. Mm. And then in the second act of Happy Days, when he keeps on saying, and this is what I find wonderful, <laughs> that there are these tiny, so wonderful so, about life. tiny things are left, or... I remember a bit of this. The fact that I can remember a bit, that is just wonderful. I mean, she's forgotten nearly everything. Or yes. he can hardly move. But the fact that maybe, maybe he'll respond to her, that would just be wonderful. So there's a sense in which he minds the small dimensions of life. That's correct. And I think that the initial take for an audience is it's reduced it to something essential. Mm. And the confusion a lot of times is the essential is minimalist or bare or deprived of something mm -hmm. and what it ends up doing is actually generate something else yes. what you call hope or something like that yes and I, I would be careful also about saying that the work is dominated by hope because the hope is sort of weak unless it is viewed in contrast against the pressure of witnessing the reality mm. of really how it is and he has a very dark vision, I think, of how it is. And so we don't want to sort of mortgage that and say, you know, that let's oh, yeah. just play with this utopian yeah. universalism. Yeah. Yeah. Happy that's, days is probably not to be taken too literally, right? As no, the that's, of the, of the that's, that's right. But at the same time, there is a fascination in that contrast between the manifest difficulty or impossibility of the situation and people's going on, people's clinging to the songs that they knew the relationships that they had, the mimicry of a marriage, even if we see very little of the marital experience, you know, right. in this, right. in terms of physical contact, they have none. But the fascination with the striving, the fascination with continuing to go under these very straightened circumstances, that to me is where he mines so much beautiful drama, is the tension between what keeps us animating, keeps us going. Mm -hmm. But also the theater has a tradition of doing a great deal with very little. If I think all the way back to the traditions of the medieval stage, if I think back to mime and physical performance, mm -hmm. 
there is a long tradition in theater of generating a lot in the imagination of the audience, not giving us all exactly what is on the surface. Mm -hmm. And especially now, I think, in, in the 20th century, when suddenly you have so much available to you technologically that he strips it down to the bare essentials, to these empty spaces, very solid physical situations for the actor, and then populates them with this text, which mm -hmm. is so wrought, as you said, you know, so mm -hmm. specific. Mm -hmm. You have so much strength there to really put pressure on the text in a Beckett drama and know that there's a floor there, know that it's been worked out, know right. that you don't have to question, right. is the playwright doing the right thing here? And in that structure and in that freedom, there's actually tremendous flexibility for the actor to make discoveries. I've never seen two productions of any Beckett play that are the same. But those that have resolved this problem of happy days have, for me, at least for my taste, and I'm thinking here of Fiona Shaw's performance in the Deborah Warner production from around 2006-2007, that there was a huge contrast between the woman at the beginning and the woman at the end. There was a vast gap covered between the hope and aspiration in this bright space and the darkness of the end. Mm -hmm. Very difficult and unremitting. Mm -hmm. And to me, that reflects a structural understanding of what makes great drama. There is a tragic kind of transformation here. Which is interesting that you're saying there's a transformation. So in this Fiona shots, it goes from somewhere to somewhere else. Correct. So the same thing little happens in the place. <laughs> That's right. So it's amazing what you're saying. There's structure. There's a kind of doubling or there's two parts. There's mm -hmm. usually two acts. There's a real shift. And the transformation is actually deeply moving. You are moving with this character. When I reread the novels and a lot of the short prose, there's a huge amount of momentum in the language. Oh, it's a torrent. It's a torrent it, of prose. And it goes on. And there's this sense, how is it going to go on? But what you just said, there's a floor to it. It's been worked through. Yes. It's going to go on because this is what we have. We can or must go on. There's a line from Gato Estragon says, I can't go on like this. And Vladimir responds, that's what you think. That's what you think. <laughs> that's what you think. Yeah. That's what you think. Or that's what you or think. Or that's what you think. Yeah. <laughs> that's what you think. And, there's, and somehow there's something, this kind of dialectic or this kind of tension, if mm. you're saying, to mobilize this between despair, let's say, I can't go on. Yes. Or I can't go on like this. Yes. So there's a lot in these two lines that is, mm. he's opening up. Well, if we were to extract from Beckett a kind of ethic or a program, mm -hmm. I would put that under the name going on. Mm -hmm. So I think that going on is the central question of the whole of, almost from the beginning mm -hmm. to the end. How does one go on? And this word on features really throughout the entire archive of prose for 60 years. I mean, there's right. a, a sort of fascination with this question. I think it takes on a world historical character after World War II and his experiences in biographically in France, in the resistance, the things he sees, the things he loses. I think there is a crux there that's often talked about, mm -hmm. a kind of revelation of the need to speak in the face of this. But Gatto, which is written as a way, he said, to get on with the horrible prose that he was writing at the time. He was working right. on The Unnameable. And the very final lines of The Unnameable, which are the very famous section, that famous comma between I can't go on, I'll go on at the end. Right. He has that last line, you must say words as long as there are any until they find me, until they say me. Strange pain, strange sin, you must go on. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they have done it already. Perhaps they have said me already. Perhaps they've carried me to the threshold of my story before the door that opens on my story. That would surprise me if it opens. It will be I, it will be the silence where I am. I don't know, I'll never know. You must go on, I can't go on, I'll go on. Mm -hmm. And this final comma between I can't go on, I'll go on, mm -hmm was taken as the name of the great Beckett anthology that Grove put out, I Can't Go On, I'll Go On. Right. But if you look for it in Gatto, you'll find it, not just in that Estragon exchange, but also in that monologue at the very end when Vladimir is speaking of the stage, and he says, at me too, someone is looking. Of right. me too, someone is saying he is sleeping, he knows nothing, let him sleep on. And then he says, I can't go on at the end of that monologue, and then stops and says, what have I said? So it's clear that he's working through this problem of on. Right. How does one go on? Right. And he means it, I think, in many senses. There's a meditation on the value of life in that. There's a meditation on suicide, potentially. But 
he goes up to the line but doesn't cross it. There's also a meditation on expression. How do we express the mm. state of needing to continue to speak? If he identifies as a writer, he must go on. Mm. I have to keep speaking. And yet he's very critical of language. He's very critical of language as such, all the way from the 1930s. It's, there's a letter from the 30s, I think, or in the 40s, where he says, I have to use language. That's the writer's task to punch holes in it, to see if there's something yes. beyond, beneath, above, below. Yeah. When you just said going on, and the, the famous quote from the end of the trilogy of the novels, what I'm hearing is because partly, partly because I've been I've read a lot of poetry in my life, I'm hearing en attendant Godot, mm -hmm. so the en is yes. the on. So the French play is written in French originally. It starts yeah. with on, which is en, yeah. estragon. <laughs> so there's an on, it's sort of echoing throughout. throughout and in some ways what you said, it's what does it mean to go on existentially? Yes. psychologically the trilogy is driven by people kind of hunting each other haunting each other mm -hmm. there's a father son there's he's, there's always doubling in him there's always somebody else and i was i wanted to go back to the you said the word witnessing earlier yes what do you mean by that in terms of what happens within the place and in the plays in relation to the audience mm. which is not just a spectatorial relation or just watching or listening to somebody. no i think it's quite a deep fundamental witnessing of the condition. And I think maybe it's connected, in my mind, it's connected to his lifelong fascination with birth and death. Thinking about the birth trauma, for example, is one of the things that he was fascinated by in his psychoanalysis in the 1930s. And he famously attended a Carl Jung lecture, which tells a narrative or a story about a little girl who was not quite born. And he notes this in his notebook and is fascinated by it. And it comes up in various passages over the prose. And we have the moment in Gado, there's a lot of reference to this phrase. Pazzo talks about born astride a grave. And then Vladimir picks that up later, the sense that there's this brief flicker of light and then heard no more. Mm -hmm. And in a very short play, like the 1968 uh, sort of joke project, uh, Breath, right. there's an ultimate compression of this idea in the contribution to the review of Calcutta with Kenneth Tynan of lights come up on a stage covered with rubbish, detritus, a brief vagitus, which is the moment of the birth cry, yeah. light to full with breath, and then expiration with the vagitus again at the end. So birth cry at the beginning and the end, yeah. and this brief moment of light, and then it goes away. It's this kind of dramatic distillation of that line from many years earlier, almost two decades earlier, in Gado. Yeah. And so I think he's fascinated by witnessing the philosophical condition mm -hmm. of humankind as one which is temporary, one which is extremely temporary when considered against geologic time. Mm -hmm. And that we could, from that, take a kind of nihilism or meaninglessness. But I think his nihilism sort of is, he's flirting with it, but I think it fails. I think he fails right. to get all the way right. to the sense that this doesn't mean anything. Right. And instead, there's this remainder. Right. And the remainder is the primacy of love, which is right. people still being attracted to each other in spite of that the body still having needs, even if the mind is done, even if the mind says, I don't want it. He plays a lot in, in Murphy in the 30s with that Cartesian split between body and mind. And the struggle, he has a mind that wants to do things, but there is constantly, the body has its drives, the body has its needs. Mm -hmm. And so he's interested in different problems of that drive, of that desire. He had read Schopenhauer on this point, there was a whole philosophical background right. to his interest in this, but I think the important element is that he never quite gets to zero. He never quite gets to suicide. He never quite gets to even showing much death in these pieces. There's very little death in the work, but there is a meditation on death deferred. My death is coming. We have this present mm -hmm. tense in the novel, Malone dies. Mm -hmm. And maybe it happens in the text. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little. There's a few other it's bad a bit, things. A bit uncertain. There's right? a few other bad things that Plenty happen. Plenty of bad things that happen yeah. in the novel. Little right? death happens. Okay, um, other people. Yes, <laughs> but I think there's still something curiously unkillable yeah. about the voice. Right. The right. voice keeps coming back. The voice repeats. There's a small phrase in the novel in Malone Dice: "The little murmur of unconsenting man." Yes. In some way, the consent would be 
consent to nihilism, to death, to suicide, to absence, to silence. Yes. And the little murmur is to unconsenting, it's sort of man speaking against the vastness or stasis or yeah. a Freudian principle of the death drive or whatever it is. Like, or just the vastness of the situation, yeah, the vastness of the void and the consciousness of how small we are in relation to the scale of that. And this is why I think the first wave of Beckett criticism was about existentialism, right? Because there is this feeling that, okay, scientifically, we now know that the sun will explode at a certain point, right. the earth will be exterminated. And at what point will we have by that point become an interplanetary species? Or is this consciousness of humankind and human creation something that's fundamentally evanescent, and something that will this, not go? This period of criticism, you mean this is post-40s, after World War II, yes. after the Holocaust, uh, and after the possibility of nuclear annihilation. So yes. The one sun of, may extinguish us, but we may also do it ourselves. That's right. One of the many voids yeah. that I think we were confronting yeah. in the mid-20th century. Yeah. And Beckett was interpreted initially as speaking about this because of the semi-apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic character of some of the dramatic substrate of the work. Yeah. So in Endgame, there's an outside. There's the sense that people are gone, but I can't go outside. Right. Outside of here, it's death. Yeah. So the kind of early readings of Endgame as a bunker play, yeah. um, one is inside this bunker. And in a sense, there's a historical reading that says that's where we are. There's a metaphysical reading that says, actually, this is a skull. I'm trapped inside a skull with these nattering voices. I have the two windows to the outside. I can't ever get outside. I can't be yeah. outside of yeah. this place. Yeah. But inside, there's this constant drive. Right. Why don't you kill me? I don't know the combination of the larder, right. is the answer. Right. <laughs> right. right. So I would kill you, but you I have sending him to physical right. needs, right? The same thing in Gado. Let's hang ourselves in the tree. But if you hang yourself first, the tree may not hold, then I'll be alone. Right. Let's not do that. But if I do it first, I'll be dead. I can't help you. Yes. <laughs> so the tree is worth it. Hanging yourself is worth it at first for the sake of an erection. Right. right. Then it's not worth it for the sake of losing, being alone. Being alone. Right. Yeah. Right. In the situation. So You're saying when it's, if Endgame is read as a model of being inside your head, mm -hmm. existentialism as consciousness, or this is a critique of the Cartesian ego, when I was reading it, I thought it's not so much I am conscious, therefore I am, or I think, therefore I am. It's, I speak, therefore I am. Yes. And this relation to language. So in some ways, existentialism deals with these existentialist dilemmas and decisions and uh, the context of Saf, Camus, all these people. But he seems to be going in another direction at that moment. I agree. It's yeah. not decisions, really. And that's why it allows itself to be read successively. So you have Madorno, you have ultimately Deleuze, all these great philosophers mm. who read Beckett for what they want him to do. Yes, even probably, Badiou, the contemporary yeah, work in, but in this century correctly. Badiou. I mean, I think not bad. They're good readings in a way. Hmm. I think the emphasis on language is really complicated there. It because is. Because it prefigures sort of the linguistic turn. It prefigures a lot of postmodernist work. Mm -hmm. You could say it comes out of Wittgenstein, but it ultimately is... That's what I started out by asking you. Yes. And you kind of corrected me and said, don't put too much emphasis just on the language. <laughs> They're well, not texts. Well, <laughs> in the drama, yeah. I feel that strongly about the drama. Yeah. I feel strongly about the drama that we shouldn't read them solely as literary works. Right. Because they are blueprints for events. And so the eventual character of the drama, okay. I think, cannot be lost. And you mean event in what sense? What I mean is something which is bounded in time. Uh -huh. I'm not speaking about Badiou and the yeah, yeah, no, theory yeah. of the event, right. but I'm speaking about, in contrast to a literary work that one can receive through reading alone, yeah. one in the drama actually has to see the situation mm -hmm. or embody the situation mm -hmm. even more so mm -hmm. to really see the character of what Beckett is working with. Mm -hmm. He was extremely alert to the situation of embodiment. Mm -hmm. And... So when he gives a text like Play, which I think is the most sort of mathematical mm -hmm. version of this change in his work, 1962-63, this is the play with the three urns, the bodies yes. in the urns, and the light calls them into being or calls them into speech in a kind of purgatorial logic. And they each tell a story of a love affair from the different perspective, each unaware of the other, but aware of the interrogator light. This play has beautiful poetic text. If we just read the text by itself, there is beautiful fluidity, poetry, there's a sensibility to it. It reads well as dialogue. It's legible. But 
the context in the situation makes no sense if we don't also include the interrogator and the technical mm -hmm. character of the theater. The fact that I have to actually see this monologue come to life being invoked by the theatrical technology. So there is this other element that comes into being when we consider it as a live event unfolding in time in a theatrical space, potentially, yeah. from the object character of the play, which is when I pull it off the shelf and I look at the text and I read it. Whenever reading the drama, I would suggest people doing those readings to try to read it aloud or set up the situation right. of the body. Or if the actor is in a constrained space, try to experience it with that constraint. See what it is to say these words under those conditions. And for that, there's great innovation in his theater for the theater itself. We're kind of working now in a post-Beckett theater. Right. And the insight is not just about minimalism. The insight is about what happened to the body in this period. And how did the body relate to technologies of the stage, technologies of illumination, in the case of Craps Less Tape, technologies of sound. Right. And then in the late Beckett teleplays, in the, the one piece for film, in the adaptations and the intermedial work of Beckett, in each of those cases, he's innovating something in that medium. So okay. we have to read with a consciousness of the medium. Okay. I think in the novels, he's also innovating the novel right. in terms of the medium of prose. Right. So one of the reasons why he's such a key figure, I think, and so durable and has created such fascination for successive generations of scholars and philosophers and readers and listeners is precisely because of the range of that achievement in each of those different genres and disciplines in which he worked, he was actually thinking about the medium, the form mm -hmm. and the material. Mm -hmm. So while there is a lot of crossover between them and common concerns, there's also an attentiveness to the form that we don't see in a lot of writers, writers that were quite happy to adapt their work freely between one and another. And, Oh, this right. is on stage. Then this is on radio. While he did do some of that, he showed a lot of anxiety about it because of how much he had thought about the medium itself, mm -hmm. the character of the medium. But actually, that's remarkable what you said, that he's exploring in each medium what is the medium. Yes. Does it constrain or enable? And he's pushing against it in each instance in a creative and productive way. Absolutely. Not in a, no, I want the play to be the play, I want the novel to be the novel, or this is better. He actually also has this enormous flexibility to say there's a new medium, so I guess he discovers tape recordings or doesn't discover them, but he mm. at the BBC or something, he figures it out, then he writes Crab's last tape. It's ultimately an actor listening to his own recording, so it's an externalized memory, which is so familiar to us today. Yes. Well, I mean, it's, it's what a lot of our devices are. That's it's pretty um, much what it is. But at the time, this prosthetic memory and using it as a dramatic device on stage for an actor to have a monologue that is not really a monologue, it's a dialogue with an older self. Yeah. That's extremely innovative for the period. And you're right, I think, to associate it in time with his experiments on radio. Mm -hmm. There has been very good work recently done on the radio, the background at the BBC, and then also reconsidering the dimension of radio performance. But the prose was read on the radio um, frequently. All the prose was always right. being inaugurated. Patrick McGee at the BBC. And when he works on All But Fall, which is the first full-length radio play, that actually is also the nascent moment for the BBC Radiophonic Workshop that Donald McWinney, his producer, founded after All That Fall caused the BBC to have to make technical challenges and achievements with sound design that had not previously been attempted. So the beginning that Beckett is also there and his play is sort of pushing the BBC at the moment for the foundation of sound effects in radio. Right. If you go and you buy the BBC sound effect library online or... Right you know, the discs that they had available for many years right. in the 90s, things like this. Beckett is present at the root of that in a lot of ways. What do you think he was motivated by? Because famously he didn't give interviews, or very few, I guess, about his work. But it's quite interesting for a playwright who's working in the milieu of the existentialist. He's mm -hmm. in Paris, he's writing in French originally, mm -hmm. he wins a Nobel Prize. And then he's on the radio to address as many people as one could at that moment. <laughs> yes. So I'm interested in this... It's a shift not only in technology, but also in audience and who he's speaking to and with. It is. I mean, I think that the stage that he starts working with radio is quite early after the war. The first prose broadcasts are in the 1950s mm -hmm. already, so a good while before the Nobel. It seems to me that his fascination 
was again with how to keep going on as a writer how does one continue to write mm -hmm. how can i continue to make mm -hmm. it's very clear that he had a powerful impulse to keep making mm -hmm. which was experienced viscerally and almost physically he often describes it in the correspondence as a voice that it's mm -hmm. as though he's hearing an inner voice that he has to communicate or transcribe and this feverish pace of productivity that follows the war from you know uh, right. the so-called siege in the room period from kind of 1945 to about 57 right. this period generates the bulk of the material for which he mm -hmm. later wins the Nobel Prize the things that we really remember him for mm -hmm. the work extends before and after that but there is this incredible productivity in that period right. and I think that different opportunities a lot of these came out of personal relationships that he had friendships but it was a fascination with voice I think that is a testament to this McGee reading the prose gives him it's at least argued in some in some scholarship that it gives him part of the idea oh. for craps less tape oh, really? which is written as a mcgee monologue so originally oh. in the manuscripts oh. it's written as mcgee monologue yeah. um and we see in other pieces and other fragments i think a piece of monologue is also with an actor in mind similarly jack mcgowan who was a friend of his an irish actor mm -hmm. he composes a mime called jm mime and the graph for jm mime which goes unproduced becomes later adopted in works like Quad for television 30 years later. So there is a working through the material and working through different media. And even in the late work, sometimes he would begin one thing as drama and we would see dialogue in the manuscripts. And then he draws a line and underneath that switches to prose. So it's clear that he was always expressing felt this again from the letters right, right. or from the 1937 letter that right. you quoted you know the obligation to express never to stop saying right. that is the thing to keep in mind you know that all these negatives not to want to say not to know what you want to say not to be able to say what you think you want to say and never to stop saying so this kind of no 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 and then yes at the yeah. end which is on in reverse it's no it flips the no on its end correct it's on. correct yeah. and the other thing you said earlier it's the voice and it's embodied. And I think that's the other part that keeps the plays sort of in my mind so relevant. That it's not sort of an escape into pure language. Yes. Which is the wrong accusation, let's say, about postmodernism. I think it's incorrect, but it's pervasive, so it's to be contended with. Mm -hmm. But this is all just language games. Right. It all exists in language. Or that writers like Beckett, like Borges, or something like that. It, but it is so embodied and grounded, and as you said, either constrained or enabled in these conditions of being on literally in the ground, on the ground. Right. Movement is incredibly important to him. The it stage is. directions are move a little bit, move a little bit. Don't head move. up, head down. Look yeah. this way, look that way. Am I in the center? Am I not? So how we are located in space is as important as how we sound to one another. Absolutely. Yeah. And the and same space and environment are fundamental as well. And the other part you said earlier, and, and a lot of these they always couples. There's so many couples in Beckett. There's a huge amount of doubling. It's yes, really interesting. There is. And he writes in French and he writes in English. So there's a kind of doubling of Beckett. I guess now he's the national. We talked about this yesterday, but the national hero, it seems, though, or the tourist attraction of Dublin, I guess. Uh, well, I, I, take I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that they far. They choice. But you yeah. see more Beckett references here than other writers. That's actually changed in the last 15 years. Okay. And I would date a lot of this change to the centenary, to 2006. He had a very difficult relationship with Ireland actually in the 20th century yeah. and I think would be bemused probably to see you know a giant heart-shaped bridge for example right. on its side named the Samuel Beckett Bridge that raised a lot of eyebrows among scholars at that time and I think there was a period when Joyce was much more the calling card for the city of okay. Dublin because it was such a Dublin-based work right but there has been a lot of great scholarly work again reclaiming the extent to which Beckett is, in fact, using Irish, you know, Hiberno-English constructions or using specific place references, okay. reflecting on the national character of these struggles. And there's 10 or 15 years of scholarship behind this now of really thinking about, in a deep way, how was Ireland still affecting mm -hmm. him even when he was away. Mm -hmm. But I, myself, am drawn to, in my own recent work, the ways in which he is transgressive when it comes to borders and he is mistrustful of the unities that borders would imply mm -hmm. and that his character as a European who is crossing between these different states, holding one passport, going to war in another when he's at a neutral country, 
the fact that his archive is now held substantially between Trinity but also University of Reading, that he had a lot of connections in the United Kingdom, that there is a strong sense of Beckett scholarship, another Beckett Research Center at the University of Reading. And so much of his staging history is with London, is with the Royal Court, or is with you know these places. There's a long tradition in great projects recently on the staging of Beckett in Ireland and Northern Ireland and in the United Kingdom. And in these dimensions of all of these spaces, the fact that Everywhere that he goes, everywhere his work goes, across Europe, across then wider places in the world, people identify with some element of that mm -hmm. as speaking to them locally. They feel mm -hmm. that it's speaking their story. It tells their story. Mm -hmm. One of my colleagues here in the department, Sarah Jane Scaife, has done extensive workshops in Asia with Beckett, has brought Beckett to Mongolia, Beckett to India, you know, Beckett to these places. And I myself have done workshops in lots of non-European contexts as well, where the identification that people have with the work is something to do with the status of power and powerlessness. That's a big theme in a lot of the work that people have picked up on. And also these human experiences of waiting, the human experience of fearing death, the human experience of not knowing where the next meal is coming from. And there is a sympathy that people find in the work that even in translation, the translation of the action itself, the translation of the language, the translation of the culture. There is a fascination with this writer as having expressed something very true about, as he wrote in a letter, what it is to have been. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that each new piece of writing by Beckett is an attempt to go back to say, this is how it is, or this is what it is to have been. And that uncertainty of being itself. Mm -hmm. That fundamental idea is, I think, expressed in these different iterations of the text. But it's enormous substitution to not say being in time, but waiting in time. Like yes. We wait for things. As you <laughs> said, right. in a terrible way, we wait for the next meal, or we wait for good news, or we uh -huh. wait to hear from somebody. But we also just wait for something to happen. Yes. Or we wait for you know, we wait for good news, but we may also just want something to happen. Yes, he's and fascinated by that action. And there's this strange kind of 20th century malaise or this kind of existentialist stupefaction of nothing happens, there's no choices, mm -hmm. because every choice will be meaningless in any case. So in some ways he casts it into this huge universe that's empty. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we do is go on and on. Yes. And waiting is double A. Right? Well, it's not certain. Right? It's, that's the right. refrain that Clove says in Endgame again and again is it's not certain. Even when Ham curses him to the heavens, he, his last line is, it's not certain. <laughs> now, I want to ask you something else. Yeah. When you say it's, it works internationally, which is quite remarkable. It, it does, also works yeah. in different media. So he gave us something that people can really connect to who probably wouldn't have been imagined to even exist in 2019. Yes. What about women in this work? It's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. He has female characters, really mm -hmm. profound ones, and then other ones are just they're very strange, and they're these ambivalent relationships. I think. Yes. I'm curious if there's a universal dimension that's also gendered. Yes, well, I would be I would be very cautious about universalism in general. Yes, in Beckett, I would like to have it work, come on. In Beckett and in other cases. <laughs> yeah. What I would say is that Beckett's education and his social status and the Ireland of the 1920s that he was growing up in, on the border between its status as part of the British Empire and its independence in 1921, and his growing up in Trinity specifically mm -hmm. as a bastion of Englishness formerly, Protestantism, wealth and privilege, previously single sex education with a small number of women initially. I would say that he did not have views on women that we would today relate as any kind of being enlightened. I mean, definitely there is a misogyny in the early work and a critique I think in some of the early prose especially, we see a kind of disaffected young man mm -hmm. who wanted the world to be different and it wasn't It wasn't as easy for him mm -hmm. as he had wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. We know biographically that he was popular with women, that he had many girlfriends. We know that there was deep love in his life, not just of one woman, but of several. Mm -hmm. And so there is, again, a tension, I think, between one of the tensions that he mines in Murphy is I think attention from this early life of wanting the 
relationships or wanting the sexual quality of the relationships, the erotic or the romantic or this sort of contact, and yet also wanting this preserved inner life of the mind and seeing those as separate paths, seeing those as contrasting, seeing one as a problem for the other. Okay. And in this, he may be in his early career resembles someone like Rilke or someone, you know, who yeah. sort of sees over here is me in love and over here is me writing poetry and the twain cannot. Yeah. We um, do have to note that Beckett was not a great fan of Rilke. Of <laughs> has a very yes. hilarious, devastating little a devastating line. critique. Yeah. Because Rilke has the fidgets. <laughs> yes. And why turn that into great poetry, which in Rilke's case may work, but why call your bodily kind of contortions God, ego, Orpheus, yes. or else? So yeah. he says Rilke is kind of on the right path, but takes the body's manifestations of our own physical existence and turns it into transcendence. Yes. And he said that is the mistake. That's the mistake. I tend so, to think Rilke is very close to making this mistake all the time. I think he probably, in really interesting moments, it's very imminent, Rilke, not transcendent. Yes. But Beckett distrusts anybody who wants to elevate this into another realm. This is right. And this is why I think there's a fascination with the punctum as well as the pensum, you know, yeah. Beckett zooms into bodily function to such a level of detail yeah. and descriptions of boils, of abscesses, of illnesses, of right. real physicality. Some of the things that got him censored and banned in Ireland in the 20th century until the 1960s. I think that this is connected to the gender aspect because some of the misogyny seems as though it is being drawn upon for philosophical reasons, which is to say reproduction, right? Anti-reproduction is a kind of way of being anti-pain, anti-birth, anti-continuation of the species. So when he flirts with this nihilism, sometimes that comes across mm -hmm. as she should not reproduce, right? This image of the non-reproductive female as a theme or as a strand. It's probably strongest in All That Fall. Every single thing in All That mm -hmm. Fall, the radio play, is mm -hmm. non-reproductive. You know, mm -hmm. He specifically chooses a type of horse that doesn't reproduce. Specifically, mm -hmm. things are always barren, empty-nested. But that has a dramatic function, right? There's a great theme in this right. of the lost child. Right. And so he's seeding the terrain with all of these images of the non-reproductive. And you could read that philosophically as a critique, or you could read it as biographical of Fox Rock and the dying Protestantism of the period, and you can read it politically as well as a misogynistic activity. My inclination would be to believe that he probably had both things in him. He probably had a view of women, especially in the first half of his life, that we would consider retrograde from today's mores or today's perspective. Mm -hmm. And clearly, he managed somehow to get himself into a lot of different love affairs over the course of his life. It does seem clear from the biographical record that he was non-monogamous with his partner. But I'm also hesitant to then judge, not having been present in those relationships, was right. that an understanding? Was that a mode of being for them? Right. Was that under discussion? Was that an agreement? What does that mean? So I don't take adultery, for example, as prima facie evidence of misogyny yeah, yeah, or yeah. any kind of negative. Right. So I'm trying to hesitate and say, who am I to judge his relationship to women in the biographical? We know that he also greatly encouraged many of his female companions, whether that was in relation to their professional careers, whether that was in relation to performers, people that he was not romantically attached to, that he still had deep, profound and lasting and enduring friendships with and people he supported. So I'm very wary of applying right. a kind of logic from today to say, how did he relate to women in that regard? What I do know is that in the texts, he excavated elements of the female experience and of voices that were female that came from a place of profound observation, profound knowledge of what the inner life might be like. And he created characters and monologues and elements. And I'm thinking here of not just Winnie, but not I. I'm thinking of the right. profundity of some of the insights into people who were in the societies that he grew up in, highly marginal, a particular type of Irish female that was not considered dramatic material in that same way. Right. And yet to excavate the inner life, the inner voice, investigate that question, and then generate some of the great dramatic text for some of the great female performers of all time okay. to approach as a kind of masterwork, this is a very deep potential in that work. Yeah, yeah. And if I could say one more thing about gender, it would be that because of his suspicion of unities and boundaries, I think in the prose, there's also a fair amount of ungendered 
or non-gendered or genderqueer play around gender and identity that identity itself is not stable enough in Beckett to give us this kind of identitarian discourse about a binarism between the good male or the bad female or these things. It actually is already breaking down certain binaries that are really only being negotiated in the culture now as right. being problematic. I actually think what you just said when I'm reading this, there were moments when I had to reread because it's so compassionate, passionate, erotic, and you think, wait, this is not a heterosexual couple here. Correct. There's a huge amount of passion and affection. There is. In all these couplings. There is. And as you're saying, whatever standard you apply, if you take the 40s or the 60s or the 80s or today, mm -hmm. they don't quite work. Because you no. can't really put the label on that, you know, whatever label it is, yes. my reactionary label, whatever I don't have, my 20-year-old right. students, more progressive labels, they mm -hmm. don't work. No. So it opens up a lot of things. It does. And that's there's great insight in that into the character of his particular modernism. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a lesson we would do well to remember in the work that in order to already assert identity as such, you have to have such a more stable floor than he right. allows us. He doesn't allow us that floor. And if you read yeah. something like the text for nothing, what matter who's speaking? Someone said, what matter who's speaking? In the hands of the writer or the hands of the fiction maker, the malleability of identity is absolute. So to say that something is specifically a male voice or a male text or specifically a female voice or female text, well, in Not I, I believe the character's name is Mouth. Yeah. So a human has one. One of the really interesting questions will be, because some of the legal questions around these plays has turned on matters of binary gender, as in saying a, a female gado cannot be played with female actors. Well, we now are moving into an era where mm -hmm. actors right. do not fit necessarily into these binary actors, right. elements. Yeah. And Beckett wrote, in my view, especially in the prose, many non-binary characters or many characters who cross and intermingle between. He's fascinated, for example, in the radio plays, this image of male pregnancy, my twin within, you know, this other mm -hmm. being that I have inside. And it could be a Cartesian diagram mm -hmm. of a little homunculus in the brain, mm -hmm. the eyes behind my eyes. It could be the kind of shell game of narrators that he plays with in The Unnameable, each character asserting authorship right. over the past ones. Right. And it could mean that, or it could actually speak very closely to the trans experience. And someone who sees that and sees themselves in that text and reads that text and sees this malleability or the changeability or the transformation and the duality of these parts within them, right. or the multiplicity, perhaps better, might be inspired to generate that work. Right. And who would we be to say no? The moment is coming at which that boundlessness and borderlessness of identity is going to have to be engaged in a much clearer I, way than it has historically. I think it's interesting what you, how you're describing. It'll open up opportunities for this current generation who will then yet have to be revised again in 20, 30, 50 years, who will have assumed identities and say, this is not even yes. what was meant here. The other thing I think he deconstructs deliberately from Hegel to Foucault, these power relations, so you have these incredible dependency relations of enslaved people, sort of in, like people being servants for life or something mm -hmm. like that, or the father and son. and. Yeah, like, just the image of Pozzo holding a man lucky, by the neck, yeah. you know, by a noose. Right, by a noose, and then who is his servant and who's grateful to be serving him. Yes. But what he's taking is basically this Hegelian idea of the dialectic of the master-slave master -slave and saying, well, both are dependent on one another mm. to shape their identity, which is a fiction. Yes, they each it's, require the it's fiction. It's power, and yet it's fiction. Correct. It's real, it's brutal, it's violent, and at the same time, it's also believing in power that gives power its power. Yes. So that's a whole deconstruction of these binaries. It is, and I think that's probably one of the richest political veins to mine for the politics in Beckett would be to look at the different relationships of dependency and interdependency and the way that power is sometimes presented but then subverted in other moments of the text, and power think, and powerlessness. What you said earlier about voice, I also think, you know, we live in an era and our despots and tyrants all over the world, right? Yes. Whose power rests largely on people paying attention to their voice all the time. Mm -hmm. So 
the US we have a president who manages to be really good at Twitter. Yep. And his power derives to a great extent from all of us paying enormous attention. Mm -hmm. Beckett plays the power from somebody just generated by their voice and someone else paying attention to that voice. So witnessing is not always an ethically pure, positive development, but to be beholden to someone's voice is also to be enslaved to that voice. Language is empty in a way. It can be used to do things in the world. It's not inherently good to speak to somebody. It can also be a bad that's, result. That's right. I think Beckett is aware of this in very strong ways. The letter that you quoted earlier, the 1937 German letter, is interesting partly because Beckett in the mid-1930s has just been through the tour of Germany. Mm -hmm. And of course, Germany in the 1930s, he's there after Hitler is chancellor. And thrall to the radio. They're listening exactly. to him on the radio every yes. day. And yeah. It's Trump on Twitter. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, they are, and he's traveling by train. He's seeing the placards and the posters in his notebooks. He's noting down the phrases and the things that he's hearing. The specific debasement of language that was involved mm -hmm. in that process and that rise to power. And he is a signatory as well in the guest book at the Entartete Kunst exhibit. He okay. goes and sees the degenerate art. Wow. And so he has an intimate, up close and personal, before the occupation of Paris, experience of the Nazis before the mm -hmm. real shooting war mm -hmm. has begun. Mm -hmm. And I think that this shapes his politics for life mm -hmm. around language. Mm -hmm. And I think he is aware of the power that silence has as well as the tool of when it is unspoken, he often speaks of language as a stain on the void or a blot on silence. Mm -hmm. So it would be best to be at the nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. that is impossible cognitively, that's impossible, what well, it's inescapable. So the question is, how do we use language mm -hmm. while misusing it effectively? Right. Right. How do we find an ethical language mm -hmm. that does not adhere to this what can be done with language. So he's really acutely aware, I think, of the criticism, mm -hmm. but he's also exploring ways of misusing it strategically mm -hmm. that do not submit him to the same logic of that politics. So this quote I had earlier, this, the little murmur of unconsenting men, mm -hmm. that consent would mean using a language that's given to you and just echoing it, yes. and just amplifying. Yeah. A really tricky thing is the function of retweeting which would be consenting to the way things are expressed. And Beckett is trying to say, I have to use the language everybody uses, yes. like every poet or writer. Yes. But I have to use it against itself, because to use it in the way other people have used it implicitly consents to their way of shaping the world. Yes. So how do you introduce this tiny difference, this murmur here, where something shifts just a bit? Exactly, yeah. So when we see him inventing in How It Is, or in Worst Word Ho, an independent grammar, he sort of declares independence yeah. from the constraints of grammar and style, which fulfills a program that he sets out in 1937. He says already early in his career that he seeks to misuse that language or effectively right. misuse language. Right. Grammar and style he critiques in that letter as well. And I think we can relate to this part of his departure. Famously, that letter is viewed as his departure from Joyce, which is to say from an additive character of language trying to get the apotheosis of language to instead unbuilding or subtracting. So a logic of subtraction being applied mm -hmm. rather than addition. And the other insight I think that you have there is that there's also the sense of the transition into French of going to another language to sin against that language willy nilly in ways that he's not even aware of. Whereas his English mastery he has knows. become so great That's right that it's impossible to not perform in that language. Mm -hmm. Whereas he goes to a place where he will fail, and through that failure will not fall afoul of the same traps that he is right, in right, his own right, language. Right. So there's a creative sort of undoing in his strategy. It's really interesting what you just said. It's abstraction. It's sort of diminishing something rather than Joy's just piling on, adding more, making it more, verbose, speaking more. Yes. To move between languages. I've always thought I'm bilingual or trilingual, mm -hmm. or whatever, I speak a couple languages. And I've never thought it's a pure addition. And I actually think you also lose something. Yes. For example, I can no longer really speak in my native Berlin dialect. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty bad at it now. I used to be pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. But the local dimensions of it don't really work. So what Beckett is doing to 
estrange himself from this language, which is innate, natural, native to him. And when I'm walking around Dublin here the last couple of days, mm. it is such an accented city. Yes. It's, all of the world is here. To me, this is very beautiful. Mm -hmm. To a lot of people, I think this is not very beautiful. They want to speak the way they spoke when, you know, where they grew up, right? I don't know. Hard, hard to know. Yeah. Actually, it's complicated here. Here, no, but I think yeah. in the world in general, I know there's a lot of people who don't want anybody with accents around because that's the migrant, the immigrant, the refugee, the, yes. uh, the outsider. So Beckett is opening up English from within by having gone into French. Yes. Right? This is actually really interesting that poetry has to work against language. Yes. And I think that there's maybe one more element worth playing with there, which is that he also, in constructing a particular kind of language, I think that there's an attempt that we can see if we map his poetry, if we look particularly at his poetry from how place-specific it is mm -hmm. in the Dublin work, in the first work that he was doing here in Echoes Bones, that early collection, and the sparseness, the kind of thinning out yeah. at the end of the late work, and the crossover between prose and drama and poetry and the works at the end that all are sort of functioning with this minimum, you know, the minimal levels right. of words that are recombined in certain configurations, that he is actually seeking on this sort of asymptote toward that silence that he desires and yet never quite reaching mm -hmm. that point because he continues to identify as a writer. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we still see that mm -hmm. mathematics of subtraction mm -hmm. and diminishment and going down, but mm -hmm. never fully all mm -hmm. the way to nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's this character combined with the fascination in the use of absence and stillness and void and silence in the theater that I think has made this such explosive work for the present day, mm -hmm. because so much of our culture is focused on the additive, on filling these gaps. American capitalism, for example, right? The whole structure of society, and it's helped me to see this from a distance, is geared toward constructing a void mm -hmm. in your desire, and then mm -hmm. supplying the thing you can buy to fill that void. Mm -hmm in sort of recognizing the problem of pain, but then giving you the painkiller mm -hmm. in response to that. Whereas the solution that we get in the Bakettian universe is to endure and survive. There's a kind of pedagogy of survival mm -hmm. in this work to get toward the state of being okay with the fact that pain is there, going on is there, struggle is there, your existential situation as regards this unfeeling universe mm -hmm. is there. Mm -hmm keep going. That's the solution that it offers. And without transcendence. Without it's transcendence. It's not Catholic no. or Christian or it's, if anything, closer to Schopenhauerian Buddhism it, or something it like It creeps this. toward a Taoist or an accommodation of the void yeah. as fundamental to ontology. It says most of what is there is nothing. And so the proper name right. of being would be nothing. Right. But because we're not nothing and we can't fully experience right. nothing, we have to find an accommodation in our life mm -hmm. with this great absence. Mm -hmm. And that can be quite a generative, productive, mm -hmm. interesting experience. It's not boring. It's not nothing. <laughs> it's quite funny sometimes. Often very humorous right? in quite... the contrast. Yeah. right? It creates yeah. the kind of energy sufficient to keep going on. Yeah. But as he often says, I would have been satisfied with less. <laughs> you know right, right, right. if we didn't have to have all of that activity that was a great exertion that little right, canter right. well we could get less but it's quite countercultural in that sense yeah. for late capitalism it yeah. still is a countercultural work and in that again there is a great lesson i think to be mined there out of what we could experience from really thinking about the possibility of lessness the possibility of a little more quiet yeah, yeah, yeah. the possibility of pain as something not to be overcome or transcended or avoided, but rather endured. And silence as not consent or passivity or resignation. Correct. That we also inhale. Yes. That breath is inhaling, exhaling. That actually yes. silence is not opting out in a way of negativity, but actually embracing something yeah, else. An open and generative yeah. Yeah. possibility. Right. So in that strand of thinking about Beckett as that sort of thinker, we are fighting somewhat against the history in scholarship of speaking about this as connected to the absurd mm -hmm. and the theater of the absurd. 
And the sort of cheap way of immediately thinking about that, often the way it's still taught in the States, is to say, because of the bomb, because of the camps, because of the Holocaust and what he had seen, because of Paris and Camus and Sartre and these figures who are theorizing it, even though they don't really agree very much at all, it's to say, all these playwrights who are thinking about the problem of negativity, the problem of the void, the problem of things not making sense, the minimalism is a response to these conditions. But from America, it's quite easy to look at that and use the kind of lightweight word absurd, mm -hmm. not in the intensive philosophical sense that mm -hmm. Camus intends it, mm -hmm. not having read Camus for the most part, mm -hmm. but, but to think of it as, oh, this is humorous nonsense maybe Ionesco, something like wrong a, and absurd and silly is happening here. A fad in Paris. That yeah, that it's, there's a fad of playing with things that don't make sense. Right. Whereas I would be inclined right. to think of this rather as the deepest kind of realism, mm. a theater of the real. And it is the real in a metaphysical sense. It is the real in a historical sense. It is the real in terms of really what it is to have been for these people and that when he depicts people on the road not knowing where their next meal is coming from being beaten at night and coming back he is speaking about the real mm -hmm. experience of these people who have done that he knows people who have done this he's seen this happen mm -hmm. of people who are trapped in a room who are interdependent who cannot go outside one who depends on the other for care and feeding and going on but who are afraid of what might lie outside that door mm -hmm. that's a real situation mm -hmm. And if we engage with these things as a kind of deeper sort of real, it opens up a great weight in the work mm -hmm. that isn't there if we sort of take it as right. silly minimalism. And so I would be inclined toward this deeper reading of the work to say he's really trying to articulate something he really believes. He's really seeing it. What he presents is as far as what he can see. And when he did give interviews or write letters about it or mm -hmm. interpret his work, he would usually say this. He would usually say, you know, I saw what little of it I could see. What you have in the script is the little that I could see. Mm -hmm. That's everything I knew I put there. Everything I heard the voice say, basically, is there. Right. So there isn't more. There isn't some mystery behind it that we will uncover through deeper and deeper archival research and finally discover, oh, this is what he meant. The thing itself is what he meant. That's what we have. And... That's why what interests me is what is the enduring afterlife of how we continue to interpret these works across media, across culture, mm -hmm. in the contemporary. What does the work go on meaning? How do we keep interpreting this thought of his? Knowing that the thought was intensive, it was long, it had integrity, right. it was intentional. What is the message for us now to take away from this? And for me personally, in my life, it has contained the twin messages of witness what is going on, really know what's going on in the world, look around yourself, see what is the situation for others, see what is the situation across borders, and then having witnessed, speak. Having witnessed, go on, and go on speaking, don't mm -hmm. cease speaking. Mm -hmm. Keep making work, keep writing, mm -hmm. keep thinking, mm -hmm. keep engaging. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see a lot of darkness if you are a witness, and you're going to want to stop speaking at a certain point, and you have to find within yourself the resources that these people find to keep going. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the ethical message is there in the work, mm -hmm. and it's enduring in the prose and in the texts. I see so much potential in that thought, and it is scary and dangerous and countercultural and but we must go on. We must go on. I actually yeah. love that you were saying to put the pressure on Beckett as a realist. Yes. This is about the present condition. Yes. And we must bear witness and speak out. Yes. Let's assume he's quite happy looking down at Trinity College that the podcast would have been a medium. He would have embraced. <laughs> he would have gone on. He would have <laughs> asked the question, what is the podcast really? What is he would have wanted to know, how do we manipulate this medium? I actually think the podcast really is a medium for a conversation. Yes. It's a three-part conversation that is between you and me and then the people listening to it. And something happens that couldn't have happened for me alone, or for you alone, or for our listeners alone. But actually something is generated that is more than these three components. Yes. I, I really thank that. you, I Nick, so. for being on the show today. Thank yes. you so much. You're so welcome. Thank That's you great. for the time. Thank you. Okay. That's great.